Well, thank you, Steffi, for that kind introduction, and thank you, Maria, and you too, Dr. Berda, for inviting me here today. And ladies and gentlemen, or lucky sperm and lucky eggs, whatever you like to describe yourselves as, I am so delighted to be here today to have the opportunity to sell, tell you about this significant award and to present it to someone more than worthy of that award. We've been hearing today about technology, and I've really loved sitting in the room because I'm a bit of a techie myself. But, you know, it is a bit of a bubble out here. And when we're talking about technology and how it can change the world, we also have to be conscious about the world that we're living in here and now. A few years ago, The Economist uh, gave a whole issue over to what it described as the biggest driver of growth in the 21st century. And no, it wasn't technology. And no, it wasn't China or even India. But it was a group of more than two billion people, women participating in the global marketplace. They called it womanomics. Today, everyone plays lip service to the importance of allowing women's participation in the economy. But unfortunately, the rhetoric does not match the reality for millions, millions and millions of women across the globe. Last November, just a few months ago, the World Economic Forum produced its annual global gender gap report. It's been doing it for a number of years now. That measures the relative progress of women relative to men in 133 countries across the globe. And it does so in four areas, in education, in health, in economic participation, and in political participation. Well, surprise, surprise, even in 2013, no country across the world has achieved full equality in, any, in these four areas. The Scandinavians dominate the scene. Iceland was top. Germany, by the way, was in 14th place and achieved the highest result in the G20, partly to do with the fact that it has a woman chancellor. But at a global level, while the gap in health and education between men and women is narrowing, so now it's over 90%. When you looked at economic equality and political participation, the picture was very different. Economic participation, only 60% women to men. And in politics, 21%. In other words, women are getting better education and better access to health in many places. But when it comes to sharing power, whether in business or in politics, women are still not getting their foot through the door. And this isn't just a problem for developing countries, for poor countries that don't really understand. This is a problem here in Europe, where we still see a gender gap, whether it's on executive boards, in management positions within companies, or indeed in politics. We need to do more. Now, I know how lucky I am to have been born, not just as a sperm, but where I was in the 20th century at a time when possibilities for women were opening up in a way that my mother and grandmother could only dream of. And they were two strong-minded women, and they were determined that I was going to have those opportunities, that I could grasp them and run with them. And thanks to them and to my education, I have been able to surf a wave that was sweeping across Western Europe and indeed the Western world, which saw women in greater numbers participating in every sector of society. And so we have a lot to celebrate, but we still have far to go. And one thing I learned is that economic participation is a crucial element in all this. Women who get and control their own money have power in this world. And that's why my own Foundation for Women does exactly that, helping women to get the capacity, the confidence, and the access to capital that they need to establish and grow businesses 
and then not only contribute to their own future and the future of their families, but actually to the future of their communities as a whole. Because women who are economically empowered, who are financially independent, have greater control over their own and their children's lives. And they have a more influential voice in tackling the issues and discrimination that we still have in our societies. So, it's part of this, we need to celebrate role models. Women who have shown to us what can be done and what we can all achieve if men and women work together. And of course, one such woman is the woman after whom this award is named, Annie Burda. She was the founder of the Burda Modern magazine and she became one of the defining female role models in post-World War II Germany, not just in business, but in the wider society as well. And at a time when it was still almost unheard of for women to stand up for their rights and to celebrate their talents and their creativity, Annie Burda said, I can achieve whatever I want. And frankly, she went ahead and just did it. And with that determination and bravery, she pushed open new boundaries, crossed new frontiers, and she didn't let the glass ceiling or the iron curtain get in the way of her resolve to rise beyond convention and influence a whole new generation. And it's because of that tradition that Hubert Burda Media every year presents this award at this DLD conference to a female leader from business, society or politics who has taken up Annie Burda's baton and has exhibited her spirit of creativity and courage. And as we've heard, past recipients of this award, Esther Dyson, who's in the room today, Marissa Mayer, Martha Stewart, and Arianna Huffington. So it gives me great pleasure today to announce the Annie Burda Award for Creative Leadership is to be presented to a remarkable woman and a friend, Vice President Vivian Redding. Ever since her days... You probably know all about her already, but let me tell you a little bit of her achievements. First of all, Vivian started off as a journalist. She worked for Luxembourg of Vought, and all that time, she fought for truth and equality. And that commitment she started in her journalism days, she took over when she went into politics and, of course, into the European Commission. And she has made a huge difference in that commission. If you look at the education world, what she has done for the universities and students under the Erasmus Mundus program is quite outstanding. Or today, when I got off my plane from London and Vodafone told me that I was only going to have to pay a little amount of money for my, receiving my text and my emails, that's down to Vivian too. And... As we heard just now, she's fighting to ensure that the European Union stands up for privacy and a proper con conduct of the internet, and that's what she's doing at the moment. And, of course, I know very well how passionate she feels about the question of how many women we should have on boards of big companies. And uh, I hope that is something that this company that celebrates this award in the name of a great woman, will also take on board, because a little bird told me that possibly your board doesn't have any female faces at the moment. It was not that little bird, it was another little bird. <laughs> so, but you know, Vivian's also been a friend to DLD, and in fact, she is the co-chairwoman of DLD Women, and that's because she understands that innovation and digitization has a pivotal role in shaping the future of society. And of course, at the heart of that needs to be 
women and men coming together as equals. Uh, in this audience, we can believe that can happen. But outside this conference, there's still a long way to go. So I'd now like to welcome onto the stage Maria, who is going to present the award with me too, a wonderful woman, Vivian Redding. Maria. Oh. <laughs> the award. They tell me it's very heavy, so I'm not going to try and lift yes, it. Yes, it's very heavy. It's beautifully decorated. I've painted it together with my husband during the night, right? Uh, Cherry, thank you so much for your wonderful words. Uh, one couldn't have put it any better. And uh, thank you for the tremendous work, the relentless work you do to empower women worldwide. And uh, I think you said once a beautiful sentence, what I wrote down. As I get older, I get more and more impatient because we haven't made it yet possible for women to achieve their dreams. And I think Viviane is as well one of those women who is absolutely impatient. And that's the very reason, Viviane, why you keep on fighting for equality, for women's quotas. And that was one of my favorite moments last year at DLD Women when you, together with uh, Ursula von der Leyen, although for both of you, it, was not, it is not really you know, the center of your department, female quota, you being uh, vice president and uh, EU commissioner for justice, and Ursula von der Leyen in those days, minister of labor, now minister of defense, as we all know, you were both so strongly, continuously fighting for women on board of companies in Europe and in Germany. Thank you so much. I think it showed your dedication. And on this uh, occasion, I'd like you to thank you anyway, in the name of Steffi as well, for being co-chairwoman. Without you, the DLD Women Conference would not have been the same. And I'm proud to announce that the DLD Women Conference this year will take place on the 6th and 7th of uh, June. Is that correct, Steffi? So for all of you who are interested, Please uh, remind it. Vivian, uh, you really embody the essence of the spirit, the essence of the spirits of Enne Burda. And there's one beautiful sentence from you, Cherry, again, if I might quote it. Um, so much of the oppression of women is based on some sort of fear about the power of females. And I think Enne would have said this too, and I know this is true. Truly, you believe as well, and I would like to welcome you on stage, and we would like to reward you with the Anna Border Award for creative leadership. And uh, thank you so much, Vivian, for being here. Thank you. That is amazing. To stand in a line of such gorgeous women, four of us now on stage, <laughs> with her, the goddess, and so many in this room, and all in honor of Anne Boda, because she was a real role model. She, at a moment in time where women were housewives, said, I'm going to do it. And she had a vision, and she put that vision in practice, just like this. And I think that is what we women, sh women should do, just get it done. If you have a dream, if you have a vision for the future, don't ask if you may, if uh, somebody helps. No, just get it in hand and do it. And that is why I believe that we women really can take the lead. Together with men, we are the best thing the world has to show. And if we are together as a team, well, then we can solve any problem in the world. But very often we have to give the lead. And I think that this is something also I have learned as a journalist, I have learned as a politician, I have learned as a woman, I have learned as a mother also. 
just take it in hand and give it a solution, and the solution will come because you want the solution to come. If you do not want the solution to come, it will take a lot of time. And if things are impossible, well, you make them possible. There were several ones. You quoted them, both of you. Women on board. Why women on board? Well, simply because 60% of university graduates are women, and then they are lost out. Now, we can, as societies, not afford to lose this talent. We need the female talent in the economy, in the society, in life. And that is why I said, okay, everybody is against, doesn't matter. I go with the European law for women to be getting the chance to have a position in the listed companies on board and to lead those companies. We cannot afford anymore to leave the ten talent idle. And then I was so happy this afternoon to hear from very different people in this room that yes, we need European legislation on data privacy. This is not a normal thing to hear from all of you that we need legislation to come in. And it is not also the normal thing I would have done because I do believe in a free internet. And if you believe in a free internet, you better keep your fingers away from it. But I have also understood that if we want to preserve a free internet, if we want to preserve the trust of the people to give out their data to the companies, then we need to have transparency. Then we need to have the rules which give the level playing field to the companies and which give back the trust to the citizens. And that's why I put on the table a very big reform of the data protection rules in Europe. And I must say, because it has been said also before, those who have helped me to get that done was the European Parliament, the directly elected representatives of the people. They understood the importance of a free internet with transparency. The member states, the governments, didn't understand so very well, maybe because they have a lot of things to hide and a lot of powers to exercise. But I do believe that the power belongs to each single citizen. And each single citizen has to have a say on the way things are done, on the way it trusts government, on the way it trusts the companies. And that is why, yes, I have taken up this fight in order to have this free internet with trust. And I was very happy to hear three days ago that this has take, been taken up also at the highest level now in the United States. By the way, I went with a delegation of European members of parliament to the House of Congress and to the Senate in the United States pleading for having rules on both sides of the Atlantic. And something which was not a theme in the United States became a theme. And now we have seen through the decision which has been put on the table by President Obama, and it is an important decision because it is a presidential um, de decision, well, that can change things. We will see now how this decision will be put into practice. What I dream of is not only to have a trade agreement between both sides of the Atlantic, it is to have an agreement for people, that people can feel comfortable, that people can move freely around, that people can reach out their hands and that they know, yes, I am protected. Americans in Europe, Europeans in America, that is the future of the world which I'm working for, a strong Europe, a strong America, and both going together without cheating and without having non-transparency and without destroying the trust. So the trust building is on the agenda again. It is a good thing. I will see this week the um, Attorney General. I will see this week the Secretary for Commerce. And together, I think, we will manage to rebuild this trust because without this trust, and it has been said very often today, the Internet world cannot function. 
the businesses which you build cannot function. If people retain their data because they are afraid this data is misused, the internet world and the marvelous companies you build will be in difficulty. Well, we do not want them to be in difficulty. And that is why, Hubert, it is so important that you created together with Steffi this DLD, because we come together, we learn from each other. I learn from you people in practice. You learn from us politicians, and together we can do it. So thank you for the prize. It is for me an obligation to continue my fights. Thank you. As, as we're having we're going to bring up let's, uh, uh, let's call on stage Mitchell Baker Mitchell and Esther come on stage